Welcome to the OrthoClips podcast. Today's topic is going to be on ACL graft choices, what really matters. I'm Saka Brahman, and I have with me uh, Dr. Milo Sewards, who is an associate professor of orthopedic surgery. He's also the residency program director at Temple Orthopedics and team physician at Temple University. Uh, Milo, thanks for being with us. Sure. Thanks for having me. So we'll just jump right into it. So ACL graft uh, choices, uh, just if you could just lay out what are the graft choices? Uh, so in a very general sense, there's uh, autograft choices, which obviously taking tissue from uh, the patient at the time of the surgery uh, from a different anatomic area, <clears throat> or you know, usually generally the same knee is where we take the uh, tissue from, or using uh, an allograft or donated tissue. Um, over the, the course of the history of ACL reconstructions, the uh, various graft choices have uh, evolved to some extent. There's a period of time where we've actually tried xenografts, where we've used uh, animal tissue uh, to try to uh, reconstruct the ACL. Uh, we've gone from uh, using hamstring tendons predominantly, uh, at least here in the United States, it's evolved from hamstring tendons to then using a patellar tendon autograft. Uh, and I think the pendulum may have kind of swung back a little bit where uh, I don't know that I would say it's equilibrated, but there's been certainly uh, a lot of debate back and forth between the hamstring and the patellar tendon autograft. Other places around the world have a little bit different ratio. As an example, in Scandinavia, there's a significant preponderance of hamstring autographs as compared to patellar tendon grafts. But, but generally speaking, those are the uh, categories of graft. And then within allografts, uh, you know, you really have your choice because it's donated tissue. You can take uh, tendons that otherwise would have a critical function. So you can use an Achilles allograft or you can use perineal tendon allograft. And, and those, you know, certainly wouldn't work as, as autograft choices. Okay. So uh, you have autograft, you have allograft, and within each subtype, you have uh, different choices. So um, so what do the outcomes data show? What are the important outcomes data? Uh, I know there's the moon study. Are there other important studies? If you were to summarize, um, what, what does the data show? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know that I've seen anything that would go along the lines of a clinical practice guideline, right? But there certainly have been hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of studies that try to compare the different graph types. Uh, and, you know, in large part, they uh, don't necessarily come up with a very definitive type of statement. Uh, there are a few things, though, that, that we do know is, uh, I guess, as close as you can get to absolute truths. Uh, one of them is that the xenographs so far are probably not a great idea that, uh, you know, if you look back at from 40, 40 some years ago, uh, where uh, like bovine tissue was used for ACL reconstruction, uh, that didn't work out very well. There would be significant reaction to the graft, uh, and the graft would uh, deteriorate. Uh, we also know that using synthetic grafts hasn't necessarily been a good idea. So in the in the early 80s, uh, grafts were augmented uh, with something called the Kennedy LAD, which was a ligament augmentation device. And uh, the synthetic grafts didn't do uh, very well either. There was a lot of stress shielding of the graft, and so it never uh, really incorporated well and became an ACL. Another one of the things that has been relatively definitive coming out of the recent research, you mentioned moon study. It's actually the moon cohort, and, and there's a lot of studies that are based on that cohort. Uh, and so there's all kinds of variations on what we're looking at, what we're comparing, what the uh, return to sport is and, and what the revision rate is, giving various graft options. One of the sort of absolute truths that has come from that is that using allograft tissue in a younger patient population uh, is, is going to definitely lead to an increased revision rate. Uh, there's a very fairly high failure rate as compared to other options when you use allograft in a young active population. Allograft seems to still be a reasonable option in a relatively lower demand population, uh, an older population, uh, one where you want to maybe save some of the morbidity of harvesting an autograft. Um, but you could also ask the question that if somebody is that low demand, uh, whether they need an ACL reconstruction to begin with. Outside of that, when you compare the other graft options, and, and the two that are most often compared are the hamstring autograft versus the patellar tendon autograft, 
Uh, in most large studies and meta-analyses, there really is not very much of a functional difference. Now, more recently with some of the moon cohort, we've seen that there is probably an increase uh, revision rate with hamstring autografts. Certainly there's some issue in terms of sizing of hamstring autographs. We also know that if you have a hamstring autograph that is not of a sufficient size, uh, it's probably not a good idea to add allograft to it to try to make it uh, the right size that you want. Uh, because again, they have a relatively high failure rate. Uh, but if you go based on this, the match size of graft of a hamstring to a, a patellar tendon, uh, again, there, there's not a huge difference in most, most of these studies. Another graft that I will say is more recent, but it, it certainly has been around for a long time. There's some surgeons that have been using a, a quadriceps uh, autograft uh, for many years, but it, it has gotten more attention recently. And so that's starting to get in the mix of whether that's a good graft option. And the benefit there is that if you take a patellar tendon and you take a 10 millimeter tendon, it tends to be relatively thin uh, in its, in its uh, anterior to posterior dimension. And so you have a wide tendon, but, but it's more like a ribbon, uh, as opposed to taking a quadriceps tendon, which is, is really a, a good uh, bulk of collagen. When you're taking a 10 millimeter uh, graft, you can make it 10 millimeters wide by 10 millimeters deep sometimes, uh, depending on the size of the patient's quadriceps tendon. And so that, that provides a, a really attractive option as a graft. One of, the, one of the things, sorry, I didn't mean to, oh, to jump on you on that, but what, the other thing I would point out is uh, often in, when you look at the history of ACL reconstruction, one of the limiting factors with soft tissue grafts is the device you use for fixation. Patellar tendon autographs uh, took on uh, a lot of popularity simply because you could get a great interference fit with an interference screw uh, into a bone tunnel, and you're getting bone-on-bone -bone healing of the bone block of a patellar tendon graft within the bone tunnels. Uh, with the advent of uh, improved techniques using things like suspensory fixation with a cortical button and sometimes using certain types of interference screws for aperture fixation, uh, which is fixation you know, at the opening of the bone tunnel within the knee, uh, you really can get ver fairly rigid uh, and uh, reliable fixation uh, of a soft tissue graft, like a hamstring autograft, or again, more, more recently with using some of these quadriceps grafts. And so the idea of the strength of your fixation and the reliability of, of healing of the graft within the bone tunnels has uh, uh, somewhat evened out at this point. Okay. Uh, so how would you d describe, or can you just give some examples of very classic scenarios for each graft choice? Because I know there's a lot of controversy with, um, and a lot of surgeon preference with the different uh, graft choices, but um, if you were to basically give a classic scenario for each of the main type of grafts you talked about that most surgeons would probably agree is, uh, is, an, uh, is a solid choice. Um, understanding there's obviously some crossover, but you can maybe go through that too. Sure. I, I am looking forward to seeing the comments on the podcast page uh, after putting this out there because I'm sure there, there's still going to be some controversy. I would say that the patellar tendon autograft is really a very straightforward choice and is, is first line choice when you're looking at uh, a contact athlete. So, so bone, uh, patellar tendon, bone, you mean? Correct. If okay. you're using a, a, if you're operating on somebody who is a, a high level football player, you know, contact collision sport athlete, uh, really it, it is widely accepted that the patellar tendon graft, the bone tendon bone graft is, is probably your graft of choice in terms of reliability of getting them back to play. Uh, and you can imagine some of these bigger athletes who put a lot of force across their knee, uh, there is a lot of reliability to putting a graft like that in. Uh, so that would probably be the most classic example of somebody where there isn't very much of a discussion about all the different graft options. Uh, conversely, if you have somebody who's had a history of uh, osgood slaughter syndrome or some other issue with their anterior knee, they've already had some problems with anterior knee pain, uh, then you might introduce the idea of doing uh, a different graft, like a hamstring autograft. 
Uh, I can give you the, the story that when I was in a military practice, uh, I expected to be doing patellar tendon autographs. And there were more than a few patients who pointed out to me that they needed to be able to kneel to be able to fire their, their weapon. And so when we had a discussion about where their incision would be, where they'd have a scar, a little bit of increased incidence of anterior knee pain with a patellar tendon autograft, uh, a lot of those uh, patients selected a, a hamstring autograft as their graft choice. And, you know, it's all a discussion of relative risks and benefits. And I can say that with a fair bit of confidence that doing hamstring autographs on them was still a pretty reliable way of reconstructing their ACL with avoiding some of the other issues. Um, and as far as the quadriceps graft goes, I, I don't know that there's a typical patient that you would say, oh, that's the person that you do that graft in. But I think our understanding of the utility of that graft continues to evolve, and there are certainly some surgeons out there that would use a quadriceps tendon graft on any patient that comes in the door, and they've shown really good outcomes so far. But it, it doesn't necessarily have the numbers uh, to support yet in the way that the other grafts do, but I, I, I will go back to saying that it really does show a lot of promise, and I've really been very satisfied with the patients in whom I've used a quadriceps graft. What about allografts? Is there kind of a case that pretty much everybody would agree is okay for an allograft. Yeah, that gets that gets back to that uh, relatively low demand patient. So I would say I know the patient who I am not using an allograft in and, you know, the the, the very easy one for that is the, uh, let's say, 18-year-old uh, high-level athlete uh, in my hands is not getting an allograft. In fact, if they demanded an allograft, I would uh, probably give them a few options of other surgeons for them to uh, see. Uh, that said, I, I think it's a reasonable thing to say if you're looking at, um, you know, a, a an older uh, recreational athlete, maybe somebody who's a professional that can't necessarily miss very much time from work uh, and so really needs to just get their knee stabilized and, and get back to their regular life, not necessarily athletic activity. Uh, that's somebody who you can have a discussion about using an, an allograft for. Um, again, that begs the question of whether they really need surgery, but certainly there are some patients that uh, they have their knee instability, they, they try rehab, they try bracing, and yet still with activities of daily living, they're having uh, episodes of instability. And so to ensure that they're not continuing to be unstable and doing things like damaging their meniscus or damaging their articular cartilage, I think it's a reasonable thing to proceed with a, an allograft uh, uh, ACL uh, in those patients. Okay, and I guess <clears throat> I revision situations, which we're not really going over, but I'm sure that's a that's a place for allograft as well, correct? Yeah, certainly in revisions and in multi ligament injuries, uh, you know that's one where you kind of have to accept that there might be issues with using allograft, but you know you really don't have very much of a choice. You only have so many graft options when it comes to autograft, and if you take somebody who's got a knee dislocation and you're doing a multi ligament reconstruction, uh, it would be a significant insult to their knee to then also take their patellar tendon or quadriceps tendon and the hamstrings. And, and those structures may also be injured in a knee dislocation anyway. So that is a setting in which an allograft is a more straightforward discussion. All right. Um, well, we're going to just uh, hit on one more topic and then we'll wrap up. So I guess I just wanted to ask you, what is your general preference and why? I mean, I do think that uh, surgeon preference plays a big role in who does what uh, graft, uh, you know, what is their graft of choice. So what's your preference if you have one? Uh, so I would say that I really do kind of go through a full discussion with each of my patients, giving them the pros and cons. Now, we all realize that we can steer our patients in certain directions. Uh, and so I would say in, you know, a, a, a football player who's heading – to, to play in a collegiate setting or in a collegiate football player, certainly anybody that has aspirations for uh, playing at higher levels, they, they tend to get the discussion that steers them towards a patellar tendon autograft. Uh, in, in some other athletes, they may have a similar discussion. Uh, you know, otherwise, I would say if, if all else were equal and there were really no differences, the hamstring autograft is, is still an attractive choice in my, uh, in my experience, in my hands. Um, I have been steering more patients towards uh, the quadriceps graft because, like I said, it's more collagen, more robust graft, and I've certainly seen good results with that. 
Um, the, the downside of the patellar tendon graft has been a little bit higher incidence of anterior knee pain. It, it takes a little bit more care and time to harvest that graft properly. Um, but that said, I really do try to tailor it towards the individual athlete's needs and their particular preferences. Uh, and then, like I said, the only other thing being that I try to steer younger patients away from allografts and then the older lower demand patients maybe towards that, that graft. Okay. Well, I think that, uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up. I guess I'll say also as a uh, former patient, I've had 20 years plus on my uh, ACL reconstruction and kind of like your uh, uh, military patients told you, uh, that bone patellar tendon bone, it it does feel funny when you kneel on it. Uh, I I will agree. Uh, Having that osteotomy down there, it's just a strange sensation. Well, anyway, thank you very much. And um, that wraps it up for this podcast. Thanks, Milo. Again, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing future episodes.